Stand with me and lift the name of Jesus. Lift the name of Jesus. Lift him up. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 16. Okay. If you don't have any, I'm going to read bits from it anyway. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to read some parts. I fell in love with this first verse quite a long time ago. And, and really, um, this is probably one of the very few chapters in the Bible that starts with God speaking. God is speaking. Amen. We are not listening half the time. God speaks to every one of us. We just got to tune our ears to hear what God is saying. Really. That's why I've been praying since quarter to nine this morning. Well, we're not praying for longer than that. But praying just today from about quarter to nine in the car. Come in here. Listen to worship music, pray. And that's probably why God spoke to me as I crossed the street. But I've got, see I was at heading for six years or so. And, and I've got an affinity with women say. That's why I'm here today. I just, I, I had, my heart, my heart was here. I, I wanted to do something in, in Withensee. And actually, if there hadn't been a church in Hedden when we came, you know, we should have planted the church here first. This is where it should have been planted. That's just my heart. All right? So the Lord said to Samuel, on one, this is 1 Samuel 16, how long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. Is your horn filled with oil today? I'm going to preach today, guys, whether you want it or not. Is your horn filled with oil today? Yeah. Because it is, that, that's imperative today. And above all other days, this is mostly imperative. That we are filled with the Holy Spirit 24-7. Every day. We need to fill our, heart, our horn with oil and be about God's business. That's what God was saying to Samuel. So Samuel has a few dis... I've been up a little while this morning. I could have preached another sermon that I haven't got any notes for. <laughs> Because Samuel's argument to, 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 to God was a human argument. He said, but if I go to Jesse and Saul hears, he's going to kill me. <laughs> See, we all have excuses. Even the great prophet Samuel had an excuse for God. Not a reason, an excuse. We all have excuses. There's two great men in, at this time in Israel. One was king and one was the prophet Samuel. Which was said about the, the prophet Samuel, not one of his words fell to the ground. Wow. How many of you can say that today? And I pray that what I said to you this morning about God reaping a harvest in Withensee doesn't fall to the ground. So, just to give you a little insight into what, how people feared Samuel. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled. They trembled. Are you trembling this morning because I'm here? <laughs> they trembled. When they met him, they asked, do you come in peace? Samuel said, yes, I come in peace. I've come to sacrifice. Consecrate yourselves. And they were happy with that because the sacrifice meant he had a, he had a heifer with him. A young, a young male, a female sheep, a, a, a cow with him. A heifer. Which meant that they were going to have a food. 
We're going to sacrifice, but we're going to have a feed as well. So they're happy with that. Everybody's happy when you get fed, don't they? Hope you get fed this morning. So when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before, before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah passed by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven sons. He had them all passed before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took his, the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And for that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Samuel went on his way. Job done. I want to say to you right at the beginning of this, Samuel did exactly what the Lord told him to do. Exactly what the Lord told him. He said, go and anoint my chosen one, one of Jesse's sons, anoint him king. And that's what he did. But here's what Samuel didn't tell him. This is what Samuel didn't do. He didn't say to David, you're going to be a giant killer. He didn't, he didn't say to David, as prophets often do, he didn't say to David, you're going to have to be quick on your feet, son, because the current king is going to throw a javelin at you and he's going to, he's, he's going to try and pin you to the wall. Samuel never told them that. Samuel never told them that you'll have to run and, and, and look after his life. Maybe even hide in some wet, dark caves out of the way of Saul. Didn't tell him that. He didn't tell him you'd have to wait 15 years before he was made king over one tribe. David was anointed three times, if you read the Bible. He was anointed king over Judah and seven and a half years later he was anointed king over the whole of Israel and here he is getting anointed by Samuel three times he was anointed we think that because we were filled with the Holy Spirit 25 years ago that was enough for them <laughs> come on guys we need a new anointing from the day that we're in See, when we get anointed, but, but I guess when David got anointed, he was thinking, this is it, boys. Step aside, Saul. Here I am. Fifteen and I know it all. <laughs> oh, there it was. Uh, I, I think Mummy got his thinking. What Samuel did say was, what he did was anoint him king. That was and is the promise regardless of what happens between now and 15 years later David you're going to be king that's good isn't it well I thought it was. I thought that was good whatever happens you're going to be king David see when we get a prophetic word like just what I gave you this morning God's going to reap a harvest here. A harvest of souls. We think it's going to be Monday morning at 8 o'clock, don't we? Mm, yeah. Oh, no, it's not. You might have to wait 15 years for it. 
This is not the end, by the way. This may not even be the beginning of the end. This may not be the, the coming of the Christ. He's not coming, I don't think, between now and Christmas. This is not... This is only a preliminary shaking. We're going to get more. Yeah, yes, you're right. Come on. You're going to get used to it. You're right. So what is the word of God to you? What has God promised you? What has been prophesied over you? Now, I didn't know God was going to say what he said to me this morning. This what I'm saying. Very good, isn't it? God says, I'm going to reap my harvest here. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, we're going to be about God's business, haven't we? Because it ain't going to happen by itself. David had to duck and die from Saul. David had to slay the giant. David had to keep his heart right. Not one hair of Saul's head did David harm. Probably don't need it, do I? The battery's gone. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. Not one hair of his head did he. And he had, he had ample opportunity. He never said a word about Saul. He never discussed him. Give him the mic, then. He just kept his peace. And he knew that God would work a heart, work a miracle. He knew that God would do what he needed to do. Bless you. <laughs> so of all the prophecies that has been spoken over you or over this church what is the one you're holding on to? see I said to you at the beginning of this God speaks we just got to be listening what is God's word to you? personally? Today. I want to flick to 1 Samuel 17. And it's, uh, it's the giant killing. <laughs> now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled it in in, in a place in Judah that's all I'm going to say they pitched their camp and Saul and Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle lines to meet see this is not like the second world war right? they had a line across and that was the battle line a bit like tug of war really I guess I have no idea I'm only guessing the Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. What is the first thing you see here in 1 Samuel, uh, uh, 1 Samuel 17, 1 to 3? I'll tell you what, guys, I'm in my 70s. I've been saved since 81. <laughs> I've read this piece of scripture, and I've heard it read, I've read it, and I've heard it read, many many times I've never seen that before that the Philistines were in one hill one mountain and God's people were on the other mountain and in between was a valley in between God's purpose and the devil's purpose is a chasm yeah a chasm And whilst they were up their mountain, they were okay. Because the enemy never attacks uphill. A chasm between them. Yeah. When they're on God's mountain, they are safe. The enemy is not going to attack uphill, but this giant wants them in the valley. And it's in the valley where the action will take place. 
Not much grows on the mountain. If you, if anybody do any hill walking here? Right? Not much grows on mountains. I was, I was born and brought up in a glen in Scotland, and, and you know, I can, I can assure you, only heather grows on the top of a mountain. You know, you don't get many trees on the top of mountains. It's in the valley that we grow. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know where you are today. Maybe you're in the mountaintop and singing God's praises. Or maybe you're in the valley and, and wonder what comes next. But that's where you grow. Yes. That's, where, that's where it's fertile. That's fertile ground in the valley. That's where you grow. Yeah. So what is the giant in front of you today? I'm speaking this because my wife has got bro bone cancer. She's not very well. And if you know anything about bone cancer, it's very painful. She's on, that's why she's not here today. Because she's not very good in the mornings. Can't move very much. But what's the, so that's the giant facing us at the moment. Let our life change about six or seven weeks ago. What is, what is the giant facing you today? What are you facing today? Because if you're not facing the giant today, you will be soon. Because that's the way life is. Yeah. I don't want to be a doomsayer, but that's the truth. 1 Peter 5 8 says this Your enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you, he's, he prowls around like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion, he's a snake. Just remember what he is. He's a snake. He used to stand up and walk about like you and me. But God cursed him. And on his on the ground he will crawl on his belly. The enemy is a snake. He's not a roaring lion. He's a snake. I'll tell you what a roaring lion is. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's roaring over you at this time. He's not a lion, he's a snake. What is in front of you today? Or what will be in front of you? You can come you can complain if you want. And just say, you know, you never told me about this, Lord. You never you never warned me about this. You never told me about this. I want to say to you, God sneaky like that. Yes, he he's quite sneaky like that. But what he did tell you was what was prophesied over there. He did tell you that you will reap a harvest in this place. Amen. That's fresh. That, isn't it? That's the now word. He told you what it's going to be. Back to David. David wants what God said he was going to be. He wants to be king. And he's only there for some food. He only turned up at the battle lines. If you read the Bible, I didn't have, I didn't have time to read it all. But he only turned up at the battle. Actually, there was no battle. Goliath came out, did a bit of roaring, and the and Israelites ran for their lives yeah. up the mountain. Yeah. David only arrived with some sandwiches. Wasn't he from fish and chips and the sea at Williamson? Just a few, I guess, goat's cheese. Whatever. I don't know what soldiers ate at that time. But you put him in the store. And God set him up. I want to say to you this morning, God's going to set you up and all. Because God's good. It's not, he's really sneaky at setting you up. Really sneaky. He set David up and he'll set you up as well. See, what was true back in Bethlehem when he was anointed by Samuel, 
is true today. It was true when he stood there in front of Goliath with nothing but a sling and a few stones. David would be king. It's God's word. God's word is true. God's not a liar. In 1 Samuel 17, 45, verse 45, the, 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 the uh, Goliath comes in and be cursing and, and blaspheming and all the rubbish getting thrown at David. He says, am I a dog? You come at me with sticks. David came in with the word of the Lord. That's how you defeat the enemy. That's how Jesus defeated the enemy in the wilderness. And that's how you and I defeat the enemy today. But God said, it is written. It is written. David came out on the word of the Lord. He came out, David with big weapons, but we defeat him with the name of the Lord. After all, he is the commander of the heavenly forces. That's what, that's what Joshua found out when he was looking over Jericho, wasn't it? When he came, came to the pre-incarnate Jesus. He says, I'm the commander of the Lord's forces. The heavenly army. You may feel that he's come against you, but if you are a son or a daughter of the king, I want to tell you today, the battle doesn't belong to you. The battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. See, one of the, one of the names for father in Hebrew is source. Source. What's your source today? Is God, our Father, your source today? He was David's source. He was David's source on the hillside looking after his sheep. He was David's source here in the valley facing the giant. The battle belongs to him. And we are on the victory side. So this is a funny thing happened to me when I was preparing this. I saw something in, that I've never seen before. So I, I can't really describe it. I saw something in the spiritual realm that David saw. David saw something behind Goliath. He saw what was behind Goliath. He saw that it was the devil that was behind Goliath. And he had just come down from the mountain of the Lord. That's a good place to start, by the way. On God's mountain. That's a good place to be. That's where peace is. That's where we get our strength. That's where God speaks into our lives. David came from the mountain of the Lord to face the giant. Start your day on God's mountain in his presence, if you like. In 1 Samuel 5, the presence of the Lord. Is captured the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord, the, the visual presence of the Lord in that day was was the Ark of the Covenant, and it's captured by the Philistines in, in, at war, and they take it into the, their their God's temple. His name was Dragon, and they put the they didn't know what to do with the presence of God, so they put them in. The temple of Dragon. And next morning, Dragon's on his face before the presence of God. <laughs> yeah. They set him back up on his pedestal again. And the next morning, he's broken before the presence of God. Hey, that's a good place to be, by the way. Broken before the presence of God. That's a good thing for you and me to be. 
broken before the presence of God. Broken in tears, that is. And I, I just think David knew this. David knew what, that, that his God was bigger than the Philistine God. Yeah. And that the Philistine God would have to bow the knee to David's God. Yeah. So he runs out and he kills him. Then he cuts off his head. Good stuff this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No matter how big the enemy is, our God is massive. Did you know that the earth is God's footstool? How big is our God? Isaiah 61 1 says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. And that is how big my God is. What does the Apostle Paul say about us and battles? I'll have to do a bit of jiggery poker here. I like a bit of jiggery poker. <laughs> I do. Uh, Ephesians 6, if you've got a, an instrument like mine or a Bible. It's old fashioned carrying Bibles now, isn't it? It's all on the phone. Ephesians 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, in which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We have to know the truth. Because the truth sets us free. Sets us free from any um, doubts. Sets us free from anything. The truth will set you free. We stand not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Jesus in me, and me in him. Christ is in me here on earth, but I'm seated with him in heavenly places. That's what Paul says. I am seated with him. Because I'm in Christ, Christ is in me. Christ is in me here, I'm in Christ, and he's in heavenly places. I'm seated with him in heavenly places. It's a different perspective, isn't it? It's a different view. You, you would view COVID-19 differently if you were up there. A different perspective on life. We stand not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ. Jesus in me and I in him. He is in me, but I am seated with him in the heavenly places, far above everything. I give myself around with what God says I am. The belt of truth. I give myself around with what God says I am. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm a son of the king. I have a destiny. Death is promotion. I am, I, if, if I die today, I will be with him in heaven. What a promise that is. See, that's the belt of truth. Give myself with the belt of truth and apply it to your life. You've got to apply it to your life. It's one thing knowing it, but you've got to apply it to your life. My feet walk in peace. One of my, <laughs> when I was in Wakefield, we had one of them nights and there was a load of people on the ground, on the floor and the Holy Spirit just moved in power. And this guy, I was sat in the front row and it was all happening around about us. And this guy put his hand on me, he says, what beautiful feet, beautiful feet you have, what beautiful feet. See, what makes your feet beautiful? You might look at your feet and think, whoa. You know, 
Somebody would have to somebody would have to love my feet. Yeah. Have you Might have a few bunions, a few corns. But if you if you walk in peace, you have beautiful feet. Beautiful feet. Walk in peace. I don't walk in trouble. I don't walk looking for trouble. I walk in peace. I carry peace wherever I go. I try to carry peace wherever I go. Even if somebody cuts you up in the motorway, I carry peace wherever I go. It's a way of life. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful in the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news. Walk in peace, carry peace, be a peacemaker. We are in a battle and we need to hold up our faith. We look back at previous victories like David did. David said, when I was on my own, on the mountainside, I killed the lion and the bear. This giant's nothing to me. We look back on previous victories. We even look back at how God enabled him to kill the lion and the bear. The one who did that then is more able to do to sort out this giant. The shield of faith extinguishes the doubts. You got doubts this morning? Doubt how you're going to pay the rent? Doubt how you're going to survive? Doubts, doubts. The shield of faith extinguishes the fiery darts of doubt. By faith, we extinguish the fiery darts. And make sure your head knows you're saved. Put on your helmet of salvation. Make sure your head knows you're saved. Fantastic, like a bonnet. Put it on like a bonnet. Saved. Amen. I'm saved. Redeemed. My sins are forgiven. And they were made. I'm saved. Because the grace of God is sufficient for me. Start the day with repentance. When you're, before you even feet hit the floor, say, Lord, I'm sorry. I repent. Father, I come to you this morning and I repent all the silly stuff that's been going through my head all night. If it's not of you, I repent of that. At the end of the day, repent of all the things you thought wrong. All the stuff that's going on, I repent. Forgive me, Lord. Any thoughts in the middle of the day or any time during the day, repent. Pray the word of God. Read the word and pray the word. The Lord, hallelujah, is my shepherd. Amen. 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Pray in tongues continually. Another fiddle here. 2 Timothy 1 says this. Uh, 2 Timothy 2 verse 1. Sorry. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of, Je of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. 2 Timothy 2, that is. Watch what you put on Facebook. Why would you air your dirty linen on Facebook? How you feel on Facebook? Because somebody looked at you the wrong way on Facebook. Why would you do it? 
rather pray and seek the Lord. You may be offended, but seek the Lord in all things. Pray first. Pray first. Don't air your frustration in public and don't get caught up in silly online arguments. It is a trap. And you have to be. If you have strong feelings about something, pray about it. Take it to the Lord who knows everything. We have to fight by the rules. We're on the victory side. We have to fight by the rules. What does that mean? When an athlete trains to win. We need to be we need to be training ourselves to win. I remember when uh, the, the, the open golf was in uh, Ireland, and it was uh, a guy called Darren Clark won the open, an Irishman. And as they are won. I think it was the BBC, it was either the BBC or Sky, but they, they come along with a microphone and stick it under your nose, don't they? Yeah. And he said, you, you're a neighbour of Darren Clark's, what do you think about him? He says, well, there's nobody deserves it better than Darren Clark. Nobody deserves this title better than Darren Clark. He's out in that golf course every day. Whatever the weather, he's out in that golf course. He's out in that golf course when dogs won't even go out. Darren's out playing golf. He deserves it because he's put the effort in. He knew how to take on the wind and the rain of Ireland to win the open golf because he'd done it continually. See, we've got to know how to defeat the enemy. Starts off small and we... And, and, and then we build, don't we? No one deserves it better. The 2012 Olympics in London, the media made um, Jennifer Ennis Hill, the poster girl. She was, her face, her, her picture was all over Britain, wasn't it? Come on, it was only 2012. It's only, it's only eight years ago. Was it because she was pretty? Was it because she was good looking? Yes, well, she is good looking. But she put the work in all her life. From about the age of seven or eight, she had trained every day. Trained every day. She was fit. She was in good shape to win the gold. That's why she was the poster girl. What shape are we in today? Have you a bit battle weary? Have you a bit uh, tired? Weary? Or are we getting stronger every day? Are you in a battle right now? It is time to take your stand. To stand with all, with our full armour on, and when all is said and done, to stand. One of my favourite scriptures, and I've got a few. 1 Samuel 1. Nine. It's Hannah, Samuel's mother. Yes. Hannah couldn't conceive. Her husband had two wives. She was one of them. The other one was pregnant every year. And she had a whole load of sons as well, as well as daughters. And she provoked Hannah and provoked Hannah. Because Hannah couldn't conceive. Her husband loved her. He even, he even gave her double portions when it came to the sacrifice. At Shiloh, he, he gave her double portions. It says in verse 8, Hannah stood up. She stood up physically, but she stood up in the inside. Enough was enough. And she went to the house of the Lord. She was intimate with her husband since she got married. But he couldn't give her children. He even said to her, in this, this text, he said to her, he says, Why are you weeping, Hannah? Am I not better than ten sons to you? Well, that's a cocky man, eh? Yeah? 
You see, Hannah could have settled for that because she knew that Elkanah loved her and she knew that she would go be well looked after. She could have settled for that, but there's a danger in settling for second best. There's a danger of settling for second best. Hannah would not give in to second best. She wanted a son. And being intimate with God and with her husband, she conceived. It wasn't until she got intimate with God that she conceived. We need to be intimate with our Father. Intimacy brings children. That's not in my notes. Bum, bum. If you want to see a harvest, intimacy with God will bring the sons and the daughters. Come on. In Ruth chapter 3, and I'm nearly finished, sorry. In Ruth chapter 3, Ruth has gleaned in Boaz's field till the harvest is finished. She goes home to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And this is the night of the threshing, on the threshing floor. This is the night of celebration because there's a pile of barley or wheat piled up after the harvest. And all the work's done. And they have a feast. And Boaz has a drink or two. There's joy. Wine brings joy. And this is what Ruth does. Ruth takes off her black widow garment. She had to wear black because she had been married before and the husband died. She was a widow. She takes off her black widow's outfit. She washes herself. She puts on perfume. She puts on her best dress. And she goes to the thrashing floor, where she should never have been. It wasn't, women weren't supposed to be there. But she sneaked in. And when boys lay down to sleep, she, with her best dress on, I emphasize, she lays at Boaz's feet. See, she had to do something to cause a shift in her circumstances. You and I have to do something to change, to make a shift in our circumstances. By faith she, she washed herself. By faith she put on a, a best dress. By faith she put on a perfume. And she lay at Boaz's feet. Stinking, smelly, sweaty feet. And her best rig out. But the truth was that she had gleaned in Boaz's field. She had gleaned in somebody else's field. But one day, she was the owner of that field. Because she had made a shift in the spiritual realm. And we need to make a shift in the spiritual realm to see God's kingdom come here. We have to do, you can't carry on doing the same old, same old, same old and expect a different result. You've got to do something different. At some point, we have to say enough is enough and put our foot down in the spiritual realm and make a stand this far and no further. We are on the victory side. That giant that is roaring like a lion will fall in Jesus' name. We were born for such a time as this. If you can, could you stand? Because I'm nearly finished, to be honest. We're going to declare today that the devil is enough. To the devil, enough is enough. Amen? So you can say it in your own words. Stamp your feet. Put your feet down in the spiritual realm. I'm a faith man, me. I like actions. Because he's a snake. And he's under my feet. Declare the devil 
Enough is enough. We are calling time on you today. You are coming against me with this. And you can repeat it, whatever he's coming against you with. Because I can guarantee he is. There's something that's niggling you guys. Something that's not right in your life. Not, nothing is perfect. What is the devil coming at you with? You come at me with this. I'm coming against you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And in the name of Jesus, and he's defeated you already. Jesus has defeated you already. And I'm standing on his word. The word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me lie down by quiet waters. There's no striving with God. He is the one who leads me and gives me peace. The Lord is my healer. By his stripes, I have been healed. And I want you to remember 1 Samuel 17. The enemy is in his mount. You are on the mountain of God. The chasm in between is the battleground. We take our, but we take our stance after spending time in his presence. And with his full support, David killed the giant. And we will see our giant fall as well. We are called to be soldiers of the king. We are not to be called, we're not called to be posted Christians. We're not called to be poster Christians. I want to say that again. We're not called to be poster Christians. We've got to get down and dirty sometimes. We're in war. We're the enemy of God. Amen. Amen. Close your eyes. Father, I just pray over this good bunch of people today that you would do a work in this place today Lord you would do a work in hearts and minds today show them what needs to shift in their life show them what they need to take off show them what they have to put on in Jesus name cause a shift in their circumstances and Father I pray I thank you for that word to me this morning, as I walked across the road, not thinking about anything, just going to the toilet. You're going to reap a harvest in this place. You're going to have a harvest of souls in this place. Father, I pray you give the leadership here, the insight, the savvy, to know what to do. Speak to them. Speak to them in the in the midnight hours. Speak to them when they rise. Speak to them when they go to sleep. Give them dreams of what you're going to do, Lord. And for everybody else, Lord, I want you to speak to them. Show them what they can do. What their part in reaping the harvest is. In this place. In Jesus' precious name I ask it. Amen. And I'm standing on a rock, on a rock of ages, standing on a rock, on a rock of ages, standing on a rock that'll never change. Never change Never change